the driving force of my research has been a desire to understand not so much the mechanics of social reform as the character of social reformers. Or to put it another way, I suppose I'm asking not so much a how question or a why question as a who question. Who is going to reform society? Are there particular qualities that might be required of those who are called to challenge unjust structures? And what might the lives of past social reformers have to say to the social questions of today? And I've chosen to explore these questions, as Philip said, by focusing on the life of Keir Hardy. Why Hardy specifically? Well, I've heard it said that it's easier to make a life intelligible if it's within your reach, if it's within your frame of reference. Hardy, of course, is not within my reach uh, chronologically. He did live more than 100 years ago, but he is within my reach culturally. He's a fellow Scot. He actually lived for the majority of his life only about an hour from where I grew up. And this removes certain barriers to understanding the culture from which he came, the conditions in which he lived, and the world that he was trying to change. But before going on to talk about Hardy specifically, I think it's worth asking a preliminary question. Why study biography at all? What value is there in looking to the lives of past social reformers? Now, there are a number of biblical passages that exhort believers to record and remember and call to mind the past. Um, I'm going to focus on one in particular, and that's Hebrews chapter 11. John Piper wrote that Hebrews 11 is a divine mandate to read Christian biography. It's clear that God has used many individuals throughout history to give vision, direction, um, inspiration to his people. And many of these lives have been written down both within the pages of scripture and written down by believers throughout history. Hebrews 11, of course, consists of the writer of the letter um, calling to mind many of these individuals, um, the things that God has done through them in order to encourage the believing community now. All of these figures are cited as being commended for their faith, and that's important. The writer sees this faith as the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. David Peterson writes that this faith behaves in a way that is consistent with the character of God and the promises that he has made, demonstrating the relevance of what we do not see to life in the present. The chapter consists of the writer giving an extensive list of figures from the Old Testament, beginning with Abel, Enoch and Noah, going into detail about the actions of Abraham and his descendants and Moses and those associated with him, and ending with a number of shorter descriptions of judges and prophets, and also the actions of King David. This great cloud of witnesses is seen as a continual encouragement to the believing community in the face of impending trials. One moment. Sorry, I couldn't. Apologies. Um, the key to these, the encouragement that these lives provide is that they help us to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Believers might be alienated from the culture around them. They might be badly treated or persecuted, but they can be encouraged by the persevering faith of those that came before them. And it's this encouragement to perseverance, I think forms the biblical basis for the study of biography. Now, in addition to the many biblical exhortations to record and remember and call to mind the past, the study of biography can also provide reflections on character, how it's formed, and its importance for theological and political reflection. My colleague Mercedes Williams wrote a blog post for the Jubilee Centre a couple of years ago in which she wrote that leaders who have the character and resilience to thrive in the midst of adversity are not born, they are formed by the choices they make. Understanding the lives of public leaders and the choices they have made in the course of their careers can give an insight into the ways in which leaders are formed. In particular, I think that many public leaders who are thought of as great or as particularly consequential today have been formed through adversity. The choices that they made were made under high pressure. To understand how they faced such adversity and the role of challenge and sometimes of suffering in shaping 
their lives might be helpful in understanding the role of struggle in shaping social reformers today. And lastly, I think biography can provide a touchstone by which we might evaluate today's public leaders. Of course, I'm not saying that we should discredit a public leader of the present simply because they compare unfavorably with some leader of the past. But studying the lives of social reformers and public leaders and what made them effective can give insights into the character of leaders against which we might test the leaders of today. So having looked at these reasons for studying biography, I'm now going to turn to the life of Keir Hardy and what we can learn from his life. Keir Hardy was born in 1856 in a small hamlet called Leg Brannock in Lanarkshire, Scotland. He was an illegitimate child. He never knew his biological father. And in 1859, his mother married a man named David Hardy. By the age of 10, he was already at work doing deliveries for a baker. And in 1866, an incident occurs that I think is formative for his development. So in late 1866, Hardy's younger brother was seriously ill and Hardy had to help his mother make breakfast and care for the child before leaving for work. This made him late for several days in a row. He arrived tired, hungry and wet from the rain and was sent to see the master, but was only allowed in after he had finished his prayers. Hardy was then ushered into a room in which the owner of the bakery sat with his family at a breakfast table piled high with food. Hardy was fired from his job and in order to teach him to be more punctual was fined a week's wages. Hardy remembered this incident bitterly in later life, writing that the memory of those early days abides with me and makes me doubt the sincerity of those who make pretense in their prayers. Within this incident, Two key themes, I think, become apparent that are going to become important for Hardy in his later life. First, Hardy was consistently concerned with the welfare of those who were poor and precariously employed because he had been there. He knew what it was like. And secondly, Hardy frequently displayed disdain for hypocritical Christians who made a great show of their personal piety whilst mistreating their workers and failing to care for the poor. By the time Hardy was 12, he was working in the mines as a trapper, opening and closing a trap door to regulate the flow of air in and out of the mine shaft. The work was hard and often extremely dangerous. And Hardy stated outright that under no circumstances given freedom of choice, would I live that part of my life over again. By the 1870s, Hardy was a fully qualified miner and was beginning to get involved with the trade union movement that at that time was growing. Now, at this point in his life, Hardy broadly threw in his support with the Liberal Party, as many trade unionists did. To give a bit of background, there were some working, MP, working class excuse me, MPs at this point in time, but they were in the Liberal Party and thus found it difficult to be truly militant in favour of workers' rights because the, the mine owners who paid their salaries were also in the Liberal Party. In 1878, the next key change for Hardy occurs as he became a Christian. Hardy had not been raised with any Christian faith and there were a number of factors that would likely have contributed to his conversion. The most important was probably his involvement with the temperance movement through which he would have met a number of Christians and through which he also met his wife, Lily. As his prominence in trade union activities grew, Hardy was sacked and blacklisted from work in the mines. After a failed strike led to a public dispute with another union leader, Hardy moved to Cumnock in Ayrshire, where he got a job first as a journalist and later as a trade union secretary. Another failed strike in 1886 led to riots and indiscriminate arrests of striking workers. And this brought Hardy to a significant realization. And that was that the mine owners were liberals and so were the government. The government was never going to protect striking workers. If pressed, it was going to act for the interests of business owners, mine owners, against those of the workers, even to the point of violence. The working class, therefore, needed independent political representation. And some writers say that this realization came home to Hardy with such force that it was almost like a second conversion. 
a political one this time. Hardy fought his first by-election in 1888 and came last bottom of the poll, but it was a significant event in that he was able to persuade a number of working class voters to make a break with the Liberal Party. In the aftermath of this, he held a conference in Glasgow and presided over the formation of a new political party, the Scottish Labour Party. In 1892, Hardy was asked to stand as a socialist candidate in the constituency of West Ham South. He won after the Liberal candidate unexpectedly died and many Liberal voters fell in behind him. In the House of Commons, he quickly made a name for himself as someone who was willing to stand up for the interests of the unemployed. So much so that he became known as the member for the unemployed. He even went so far at one point as to state that the government that does not legislate for the unemployed does not deserve the confidence of this house. A statement made all the more incendiary when you consider it was made in his maiden speech. Hardy campaigned for higher income tax for those earning more than a thousand pounds a year. A thousand pounds of course being a very large amount of money in those days. And for the money raised to be put towards old age pensions and education for the working class. Hardy also made a name for himself as someone who was unafraid to criticize the monarchy at one point, he made a motion to add a message of condolence to the families of those killed in a mining explosion in Wales to an address congratulating the Duchess of York on the birth of her son. The motion was denied and Hardy proceeded to make a speech criticizing Parliament's servile attitude towards the monarchy. One contemporary reporter described the scene in this way. The house rose at him like a pack of wild dogs. His voice was drowned in a din of insults and the drumming of feet on the floor. But he stood there, white-faced, blazing-eyed, his lips moving, though the words were swept away. In this, Hardy stood completely alone. In this incident, no MP stood with him, but he held his ground. In 1893, Hardy presided over a conference in Bradford, which witnessed the formation of a new organisation called the Independent Labour Party. Now, the ILP is not the Labour Party as we know it, but it's an important precursor organisation. And Hardy also formed a newspaper called The Labour Leader. In 1895, Hardy lost his seat in West Ham, uh, following which he spent time traveling around the UK, speaking at socialist meetings. Um, also, he also traveled abroad um, and made connections with socialists there, notably in the USA, and also gave speeches and wrote articles opposing the Boer War, which began in 18, 18, 1899. Also in 1899, Hardy became involved in a very public dispute with a man named John Campbell White, better known by his title, Lord Overton. Overton was a prominent industrialist. He owned a chrome factory and was a benefactor to evangelists and a supporter of keeping the Sabbath free from work. In fact, conditions in his factory were awful, extremely dangerous. Men were working 12 hours a day breathing in toxic dust and vapor, and they had their wages docked if they refused to work on Sunday. Hardy wrote an excoriating series of articles in the Labour Leader in which he exposed these conditions completely. Attacking such a pillar of the community brought a host of opposition down on him. He was attacked in the press and also faced attack from the clergy. He was accused of trying to stir up a scandal. And interestingly, this incident results in some of the clearest statements we have of Hardy's own faith. Hardy stated openly that I believe in Christ's gospel of love and brotherhood and service. He went on, I have great faith in the power of Christ's gospel, which our churches so shamefully pervert as a regenerating force over the hearts and lives of men. And because of this, I want it to have a fair chance of doing its work and that it cannot have so long as it is burdened by such weights as Lord Overton. Hardy's campaign was a success. Overton eventually agreed to increase wages, improve conditions, and largely abolished Sunday working. I think it's worth taking a short pause at this point from the narrative of Hardy's life to consider the kind of faith that he was defending against these attacks. Just what kind of Christian was he at this point in his life? Paul Bickley has called Hardy's faith primitive biblical radicalism. Hardy took the Bible fairly literally, and he never seems to have questioned the historicity of Jesus 
or the political relevance of his teachings. In his published speeches and writings, Hardy appeals very frequently to biblical and Christian language. In his major work, From Serfdom to Socialism, he devotes a whole chapter to the relationship between socialism and Christianity, in which he draws on the Bible, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, and also the writings and practices of several movements in church history. Hardy claims that communism, the final goal of socialism, is a form of social economy very closely akin to the principles set forth in the Sermon on the Mount. Writing of the Sermon on the Mount, he goes on, in its lofty contempt for thrift and forethought, it goes far in advance of anything ever put forward by any communist, ancient or modern. It should be noted, of course, that as he was writing before the Russian Revolution, Hardy doesn't have the same kind of negative baggage associated with the term communism that many of us would have today. Hardy often had an uneasy relationship with the institutional church. After having been very committed to church attendance in his 20s and 30s and having served as a lay preacher, he doesn't seem to have attended church at all after entering the House of Commons. He frequently found himself being labelled an atheist by the evangelical clergy of his day, many of whom were opposed to his socialist principles. Hardy, for his part, levelled some caustic criticisms at the church, which he saw as uncaring in the face of the suffering of the poor. Despite the oppositional nature of some of his dealings with the church, it appears clear to me that Hardy's faith was at least in some sense a driver of his socialist politics and his social reformist outlook. Bob Holman, one of Hardy's biographers, summarizes it in this way. He met a Christ who sympathized with the poor rather than the rich and who urged his followers not to lord it over others, but to act as their servants, they were brothers. Now, around the same time that Hardy was involved in his fight with Lord Overton, he was also able to build links between the ILP and the Trade Union Congress. This resulted in the creation of a committee that was called the Labour Representation Committee, the LRC, the aim of which was to try and create an independent working class group in Parliament. In 1900, Hardy was returned to Parliament representing the constituency of Merthyr Tydfil. Despite the intentions of the TUC, there was still no working class group in the House of Commons, and Hardy found himself politically alone again. During the early 1900s, the LRC won a few by-elections and then saw a breakthrough at the general election in 1906, when 50 candidates stood on an LRC platform and 29 of them were elected. The new MPs met on the first day of Parliament and they agreed to call themselves the Labour Party. In the leadership elections for the new party, Hardy was elected leader, though by quite a narrow margin. His leadership of the Parliamentary Labour Party is not generally regarded as a success, mostly due to weaknesses in his people management skills and the fact that he was never entirely comfortable with the wheeling, dealing and rather stuffy conventions in the House of Commons. Hardy continued to fight for the causes of those excluded from power. In particular, he became a passionate campaigner for women's suffrage, both inside and outside of Parliament. In 1907, Hardy was seriously ill, and in order to recuperate, decided to spend time traveling around the world. He visited the USA again, and spoke out against colonialism in India and South Africa, returning to the UK in 1908. At the general election in 1910, Hardy retained his seat and substantially increased his share of the vote. 1914 brought the First World War. Hardy was fiercely opposed to the conflict, believing it to be inherently contrary to both Christianity and socialism. In response to this opposition, he met with some of the most vicious criticism of his life. It got so bad that he was heard to say that I understand what Christ suffered in Gethsemane as well as any man living. In January 1915, Hardy suffered a mild stroke. Though he was obviously ill, he initially refused to rest, though he later went to a hydro to recuperate before returning to Scotland. His health continued to worsen and he ultimately died of pneumonia in September 1915 at the age of 59. So what can we say about Keir Hardy then? From a modern perspective, he seems to be a, a complex and sometimes contradictory figure. There is a lot in him that we can admire and also not a little that is hard to admire. Fred Reid, 
writes that every Labour tendency can construct its own Keir Hardy. The broad church, socialist momentum, Christian socialism, political pragmatism. Hardy is not one of us. He belongs to history and to no political movement of the present time. Reid's point is a valid one. In assessing the legacy of anyone from the past, it's important to recognise that they belong primarily to their time and not ours. While Hardy consistently fought causes that we would regard as just today, from the rights of the unemployed, to votes for women, to anti-colonialism, his ideas are very frequently very much of his time and can sometimes sound quite strange to modern ears. I think the answer to this is that whilst he can't be claimed by any one of these movements, his powerful moral voice can still speak today and there are distinct lessons that we can draw from his unique life. Now it's worth noting that Hardy is not the only social reformer that can teach us these lessons, but these are things that I think are key from his life. Hardy, in many ways, is a classic example of a certain kind of social reformer. Um, those who are unappreciated within their own time and see the greatest popularity and results for their ideas after their own death. Within Hardy's own time, he didn't succeed in doing much more than raising the consciousness of working class people. He never held ministerial office and never saw the Labour Party form a government. However, within 10 years of his death, in 1924, the Labour Party achieved its first short period in government under Ramsay MacDonald. And by 1945, it had won a majority for the first time. Of course, many of us will know that Clement Attlee's Labour government was able to realise policies that Hardy could have only dreamt of in his own lifetime, not least the establishment of a welfare state together with a universal healthcare system. The, perhaps the crowning achievement of a political movement that I submit would not have been possible without Q Hardy. There is a clear lesson here about the nature of success in social reform. While some social reformers have achieved real concrete successes in changing laws and structures within their own lifetime, sometimes success lies more in building a movement of people that will last beyond you. A second lesson I think we can learn from Hardy's life is that is a, his willingness to stand alone and to endure sometimes vicious opposition for his beliefs. I've already mentioned his opposition to the First World War and also criticisms of the monarchy. Generally speaking, I think our culture today doesn't really recognize difficulty or struggle as a vehicle of growth, but prefers to see it as an obstacle to our success or our freedom or our happiness. But I think the life of Keir Hardy and the lives of other social reformers that have suffered for their beliefs, makes quite a sharp statement. If we truly seek to reform the conditions of society, then struggle will come. This struggle might be intense. Um, it might result in damage to reputation. It might even result in physical harm. But Hardy's life can show us that such struggle is, is the price you pay if you desire real change. And lastly, I think Hardy's life can speak to us of the importance of popular pressure and agitation in social reform. Right to the very end of his life, Hardy saw himself as an agitator more than a politician. He wrote that my work has been to try to stir up a divine discontent with wrong. Whilst he never advocated for revolutionary violence, Hardy consistently felt more comfortable on a platform at a mass demonstration than in the chamber of the House of Commons. Hardy would very likely be found supporting mass movements for social justice in our own time, though well, he might have had some catching up to do in regard to the issues involved. His life really is a testament to the power of popular grassroots movements to make real change, sometimes regardless of the actions of individual politicians. Now, as with any biography, I hope that discussion of Keir Hardy's life will lead to a fresh consideration of our own lives and our own efforts at social reform. And most of all, I hope that considering the lives of social reformers might help us to focus anew on the life of Christ as we see his life and his character reflected back in theirs.